go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, Courtney, could you put the agenda on the screen for us? Thank you. Welcome to our October 28th, 2020 regular board meeting. Um, we'll have our flag salute this, after, this evening. Uh, Diane Hodge, our financial officer, please. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next, we'll do our approval of the agenda by um, Dr. Maxwell. Any oh, changes you. we should be aware of? Uh, just two minor changes to make you be aware of. Stages of reopening document was updated. Um, there was a and or, and we just removed the and, and it just is or, so just a grammatical change. Consent agenda updates, contracts report was added, additional check summary added. Those are the only uh, changes to the agenda. Thank you. I will move that the... Um... Agenda be approved as revised this evening. Thank second. you, Susan. Do we second. have a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the agenda as written this evening uh, as amended. Uh, any other discussion? If not, just uh, all those in favor, please thumbs up. Good. And those against? Uh, reports, correspondence, and programs. Uh, we first have our Pullman High School ASB report. Yes, we have uh, Mia Oki, I believe, with us tonight, and we've asked her to give a ASB update. So Mia, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, perfect. Hi, I'm Mia. Um, so we kind of had a late start this year with ASB, but we wanted to make sure everything was done properly. Um, ASB is meeting every Friday and we started a new Instagram page and we're currently doing a raffle to get followers to just like make a new platform for us to use this year. Um, we're finishing up class officer elections. There was a bit of a close call with the juniors and so we're re revoting just to make sure everything's been doing like done right like through the constitution um, and we're going to have a virtual costume contest for Halloween so that's super exciting. I'm going to have people send us in pictures and we'll do like a couple's costume, just like a singular costume and then a pet costume. And then ASB will narrow it down and then we'll have the students vote. Um, the ASB members are also um, attending a virtual leadership camp this weekend with a bunch of schools from all over the state. So that'll be exciting. Basically, we're just getting back in the groove and getting everything started. But yeah, we're really excited. Awesome. Uh, who's doing the virtual leadership program? Who's heading that up? Um, it's the AWSL one. Okay. Is that the state organization for ASBs or what? I'm not really sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have our board reports and we can start uh, Amanda. I have no report tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Susan? No report tonight, thank you. Okay. Allison? Also no report, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nathan? Uh, just a quick note, um, the Kamiak Art Committee, I suppose, uh, the committee to spend the state grant on artwork that we have been running the last eight months is getting very close to a decision uh, on recommending some artwork for Kamiak Elementary. Um, and I, I uh, don't think I can quite share yet who it is because I think we're looking at, you know, some specifics, but I think everyone's going to be really happy. Uh, we've been going to several meetings over the last six or eight months, and uh, we recently just had uh, sort of a close-off meeting where we decided on most things, and now it's just kind of a couple of, uh, a couple of preferences that we have to work through. But I, I think the committee's done a really good job. Um, everybody's been really congenial and happy to discuss artwork, and it's just been really fun, you know, to, to be a part of it. Good. Thank you, Nathan. 
Could I just? Uh, Allison, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to mention to Mia because this is her first meeting here. First of all, thank you so much. Your report was fantastic. Um, you uh, are under no obligation to stay for the rest of these meetings ever. Um, so it, you will always be kind of first on the agenda and you can feel free to leave as soon as you want. And I just wanted to mention that in case no one told you. But you are welcome to stay. We Absolutely. Don't... Right, like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to head out then. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thank you, Mia. Thank you for coming. Uh, next, we'll move on to our superintendent's report, Dr. Maxwell. Uh, thank you, Dr. Everman. So a uh, couple updates quickly. Uh, construction update, uh, a lot of progress is being made at the uh, LMS Lincoln Middle School renovation expansion. They're actually we're putting roofing on today as far as the sheathing. Um, so you're starting to see that uh, wing take shape and that looks great. Um, no problems reported thus far. Electricity is back on, um, so that's moving in a, in a great direction. I checked on the uh, Whitman County Transportation Cooperative site. Uh, they haven't been moving dirt because of the weather, but they have been working on utilities and uh, doing some trenching and uh, piping. So that's uh, continuing to move on. So really happy about the progress. Um, I also, just as a reminder, you might not have seen um, one of my various emails from today, but one uh, talked about some good news regarding the assessed value and the relation to our bond. So it's, uh, we had conservatively uh, guessed at a 2% growth rate. It's actually 3.7, which will translate into a four to five cent uh, savings per thousand for our uh, community members. So a bit of good news. Um, and I just wanna uh, just share my thanks for our entire uh, staff for all the work that they've been doing uh, during this school year. It's really, really been uh, challenging in many respects and they are rising to the occasion and, and doing the best that they can to uh, figure out better ways to connect, engage students and everyone's doing a, a great job from bus drivers uh, maintenance, district office, teachers, paras, specialists, itinerants. I don't want to leave anybody out, food and nutrition. So everybody's really working hard, asking good questions and problem solving together. So just a big shout out to the entire staff. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Bob. Uh, how does the information get out to the public about the uh assessed value 3.7 percent growth rate does that go out in the community update or on our website or what uh, we could um, put together something for uh probably the newsletter we can get it out on that and uh, we could probably put it on the website as well so good thank you uh next on our agenda will be the visitors section and i understand we have several visitors this evening uh so i'll I'll go through the preamble here. Um, so those that have signed up, um, they will address the board uh, with the unmute their microphone and, and they will call in and state your name and address prior to presenting their information. Uh, the board will listen and may offer clarification, but will not discuss the topic at this time. The board may consider moving the topic presented to a future meeting date as a discussion item. And uh, we ask that you please keep your comments civil and respectful and limit your remarks to three minutes. Individual speakers may not gift their time to other speakers. And uh, please listen for your name as you will be called to speak in the order in which you signed up. Um, and Courtney, you'll be you'll be doing this, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. So first up is Amanda Stahl. 
Hello, my name is Amanda Stahl. I'm at 212 Brayton Road in Pullman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and thanks to everyone for all that you've been doing. I know everyone's been working really hard and giving everything a lot of thought. I just have a few questions about the reopening plan for the elementary schools in the district. The first one is given that our county has a 10% positivity rate and community spread has begun, We'd like to know how this information will factor into decisions about when students will return to school. The second question I have is how will the district make sure that physical distancing standards will be met and can be met before returning a full class to each classroom? Um, might the hybrid time be extended if we need to to meet these criteria? And in other words, if a teacher is unable to fit their 20 plus students in a classroom with the distancing requirements, will the return to full time be delayed? Um, and then my last set of questions uh, is, is about what the protocol will be if, when and if someone in a class has a positive COVID-19 test. So will the families of students in that room be promptly notified if there is a case? Um, are there plans for a whole class to quarantine if that happens? Or will families have an option to quarantine and, and have their kids be able to continue their lessons at home for those two weeks? Um, those are the questions I have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Amanda. So those, are, those are great questions. Um, any clarification from the board? Uh, I mean, I, I, I do wanna just clarify for Amanda that we generally don't respond to the public comments, um, but I would request, I know Bob uh, has a very substantial plan that we've been working on that does address most of her questions. And so I would like to request that Bob, uh, after the meeting, send uh, responses to each one of those individually, um, just because I, I, I don't think I'm competent enough to, to do so. And I'm not sure, you know, we have the time. And I'll be, I'll be happy to respond. Many of these will be on our FAQ as well. So, um, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll respond back. Good. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Courtney, I think we're ready for uh, our next visitor. Desiree Gould. Hi, I'm um, Desiree Gould. I live at 785 Southeast Sherwood Court for two more days. Um, <laughs> um, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank all of you for um, allowing me to speak here. And then I want to thank Dr. Maxwell for your response. I did get your um, email and um, many of my concerns were, were addressed. Well, many of my questions were answered. Um, I just have a couple of things that I want to, and I um, just emphasize um, with, with all of this, um, I kind of, um, I appreciate the questions that Amanda asked because I've had those same questions. Um, but my biggest one that the emphasis and I and although I don't represent the, the specialists, a number of specialists have said the same thing to me um, is the concern over exposures per week um, to the students. The fact that you are still not even meeting together in, in a room makes me very nervous as to why I'm going to be in a room with a lot of kids and I'm going to be in several rooms and I'm going to be moving from class to class. And um, I, I'm going to, my exposure level is going to be much higher than even a classroom teacher um, overall. And the CDC just last week, and I don't have the, um, the, the study in front of me, but one of the things that came out was that the exposure, um, the 15 minute exposure is now cumulative. It is not, it is not um, continuous. So when they say 15 minutes in 24 hours, they're talking about cumulative exposure. Now, granted, because I'm going to be within a classroom with you know kids for up to 40 minutes, and so just keeping all that in mind, I just I just want you to know that I, it's like I I love teaching. I love teaching art. Um, it's probably one of the most fun things I've ever done in my whole life. Um, and I know how hard the things that you guys have to do because I've been an administrator, I know what it takes. And I know that when there are no easy answers that everything is hard. And so, but I just wanna um, remind you that I'm just, that's one thing that I'm super nervous about is the number of exposures over a week to lots of different kids. So um, I think that's, and then I have the same question as Amanda, which is if one of my kids gets sick, 
where what's going to happen to me and i'm assuming that that's all going to come out so um thank you for um your time and for letting me speak thank, thank you desiree thank you does the board have one any clarification on desiree's comments if not we'll move on to our next visitor courtney holly o'connor hello thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. My name is Holly O'Connor. Address is 400 Southeast Crestview. And I am, I guess, thirding Amanda Shaw's uh, comments regarding how we're having an increase in cases. We're moving into winter. We're seeing a lot of science that supports that exposure rates are likely going to go up. The fact that you guys are not even meeting in to get together to hold this board meeting raises huge concerns for me as a business owner um, that if you guys aren't willing to meet, how is there an expectation for our teachers to be in these classrooms with kids and the increased exposure kind of following up on what Desiree said, the specialists are going to be moving throughout the different rooms, thus increasing their exposure. So my question is, if this is, how is this aligning with the school board's values? and their missions as it regards our, our teachers, our staff. I know you guys have a lot on your plate. I totally sympathize with you guys. As a business owner, we have a lot on our plate, although different. Um, it's a difficult situation that we're all in. Uh, following up on what Amanda said and kind of what Desiree said, what is the plan? I understand there's an FAQ that Bob's gonna be putting together. I'm sure that Dr. Maxwell was part of uh, informing those decisions as to what you guys are doing. I'd like to know what the time frame is on all that information being updated before the schools open in two weeks so that family members can be prepared for the contingencies that are laid out in the FAQ and or the plan that you guys have put together. Um, this is just coming from somebody who needs to know beforehand, not days before, but sufficient amount of time so that we can make the appropriate um, changes in our lifestyles so that if there is an exposure in our classrooms, it's not coming home to our families. Um, so those are those are some big concerns. Just really, Amanda hit it on the nose. So thank you, Amanda. Um, if we can get those addressed, if I could get those answers as well, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, I think that is that's a summary of my conclusions of how I feel. <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you, Holly. Thank you very much, Holly. Any uh, clarification points Jim? from the board? I would like to, Jim, please. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, first of all, we can. We are not allowed to meet in a meeting in person. It is a governor a mandate from the governor that comes out monthly for the month. And you will see that any open public meeting has been mandated to be virtual. So it's not our choice that we can't be there, it is the governor's choice that we are not allowed to be in there. And secondly, uh, I think, well, for me, we spent a couple of years working on student cult or on school culture and district culture. And what came out of it was students first. And that the reason I'm on the board is for the students, for our kids to make sure that they have the best possible experience and education. And it has been, it's being discovered daily that these kids are not doing well with the virtual learning. And we have to do something to help them and, and, and stop the struggling that's going on with these students. Or we're going to lose a lot of kids and uh, they just won't carry, carry on. So those are my two um, clarifications. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Next is Waylon. We'll move on to our next visitor, Courtney. Waylon. Oh, sorry about that. I couldn't quite hear um, through the speaker. Waylon Safransky, address 475 Southwest Ramsey Court. A pretty brief question. I've been through the um, elementary school and other reopening and I'll use that elementary lens right now, FAQ, and I think you all have done a really good job with transparency. I was just wondering, um, and maybe this is something that can be clarified or that I missed, beyond the uh, county, Whitman County Public Health Director um, 
his recommendation, what other metrics, if any, are being used to determine a, a plan or a timeline for reopening? Thank you. Thank you, Waylon. Thank you, Waylon. Uh, that, that question also may be answered by Bob um, in due course. And again, uh, Bob, will you will you write that response to Waylon and just CC the board? Yeah, I will um, work with uh, Troy on a response regarding that. So we also have uh, a response on our website. Um, currently so but i will i will get that to Waylon, and courtney has the information so i will work on getting responses back to all our visitors tonight nathan uh i just i just wanted to remind the group and the the audience that the return date has not been decided mm -hmm. yet so um you know the two week uh, you know, sort of, sort of Damocles that we all have hanging over our heads is is not in set in stone. And so that was one of the things I hope to talk about tonight. Um, and so once we pull this item up on the agenda very quickly, it uh, I would like to talk about that. But I'd also like to just piggyback on Susan's comment. You know, our students first Pullman Promise states a consistently welcoming, healthy and safe environment. Um, and so, you know, it has to be welcoming, but it has to be safe and healthy. And so I just wanted to remind you guys of that and then I'll be quiet. Thank you, Nathan, for the clarification. Uh, Courtney, do we have any other visitors? That is the last of the visitors. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the visitors from this session. You can continue to watch the meeting live on our Pullman Public Schools YouTube website. Thank you to all the visitors that uh, spoke this evening. We appreciate it very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you guys for your time. When you're ready, Courtney, go ahead and put the agenda back up. Okay, just one almost here. All right, I think we're left there. Thank you, Courtney. Um, consent agenda, Jim. The consent agenda is our next item on the um, um, for the meeting. To expedite business at a board meeting, the board approves the use of the consent agenda which includes item considered to be routine in nature. Any item which appears on the consent agenda may be, be removed for, from the consent agenda by a member of the board or voted and voted on separately. Uh, the remaining items will be voted on by a single motion. Do, uh, do we have changes to this? I thought we did, didn't we, didn't we Bob? Yeah, on the consent agenda, there con contracts report was added and an additional check summary was added. Okay. So I hear a motion for approval of the consent agenda as amended. So move. Second. I hear a second. Second. Thank you. It's moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda as amended. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please uh, give me a thumbs up. Thank you. We now move in up. Oh, can we back up just a minute there, Courtney? Okay. Uh, we now uh, move into our action items. The first action item will be presented by Joe Thornton, Resolution 2021-09, Kamiak Elementary School Commissioning Resolution. Joe? Good evening. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> having me here tonight. Uh, at the last meeting, I asked you, presented to you and asked you to consider a resolution to accept the commission report for Kamiak Elementary School um, in the process of that meeting two weeks ago, Allison asked a very good question, why is it so much longer? So I dug into that. Part of it is the density of the document, um, just how much, how efficiently they use space. 
But the bigger, biggest factor is the CAMIAC commissioning report includes all of the field reports that they collected on every visit. And those are not included in the PHS report. Those are available to us in a file, but those are not included in the reports. So any questions about the CAMIAC commissioning report I presented two weeks ago? I would move that we approve the CAMIAC report as presented. Second. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Amanda. Um, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the CAMIAC elementary commissioning report. Uh, any further discussion? Um, Allison, did you have some questions on that? I don't have any questions. I mean, I, I could see for myself um, the reasons why it was so long, but I don't feel comfortable saying that I've reviewed that report in its entirety. I didn't feel that it was um, a document that was useful because it was so huge um, and cumbersome. And this is no fault of the districts, but I'm just saying, for me, if I want a report, I want something ideally under 50 pages where I might have some hope of easily navigating to the information that I'm looking up. So I, I don't feel like I can really say that I've reviewed that document. I'm a real literalist, unfortunately. So I, I'm not going to sign this resolution as it's written. Um, and I just would hope that we could communicate in, in future commissioning reports. Um, maybe there's a way to separate out the part that we really need to look through and say that we've reviewed in its entirety. Joe, that's this a, report, that's a good point. okay. Joe, this report was written, uh, a construction services group is the ESG group that uh, goes through every all the um, documents. So is this correct. isn't, like the report from the constructing, uh, the construction company. This is the one that goes through all the reports that did it um, prior to construction and then after construction. That's Correct, sure. so this, this is the independent third party commissioning agency, CSG, separate from the architect, separate from, um, and this goes back, this is an, an ever evolving document because it starts when the project starts and doesn't is not completed until they close commissioning and that means that they they think everything's working correctly um so i do understand and respect and i'll communicate this to csg that you could feel like you are when i give you a document like this it's, it's like drinking through a fire hose um and i certainly don't feel that same way because i am at a weekly construction meeting, I'm getting fed all that information in drips. So I, I, I feel more like I'm drinking through a water bottle when I'm getting the information as opposed to a fire hose. Um, so I can certainly respect <clears throat> that, that concern that you, that, you, that you have, Allison. But this is a document that goes back from the moment they put a spade in the ground and started to move dirt, compact dirt, and all those different elements of the, of the project. Yeah, this is a, the specialists in each area, like all sorts of different kinds of engineers and everything else that are, do they come and they don't, do they physically come and visit the building again to, before commissioning or how did they yeah, decide they are, it's okay? They are, they do a continual visit depending upon what's happening at the time. Uh, it may be, it may be once every two weeks, it may be several times a week, depending upon where we are in the construction project. So for example, when they're in the midst of installing the boilers and the chiller, I'm gonna guess they were probably on site every two or three days. When they were when they were doing um, the foundation, I'm gonna guess that it was probably once a week or once every two weeks. Okay. If I could just add um, in previous years, I, I really have read every, pretty much every word of those commissioning reports. Like if you give me a report, I'm actually gonna read it if it's hundreds of pages long, but a thousand pages, no, you know, like there has to be. So this just, this was me hitting my breaking point. So. I'm just gonna ditto Allison's comments. <laughs> yeah, message received. 
<laughs> Joe, um, in the scientific literature, we have consensus statements, we have synopsis, we have all sorts of ways to summarize data. Uh, could you present that as a possible alternative in the future? Yes. Yes. And well, and for Allison's sake and my sake and the rest of the board's sake, try and limit it to maybe a hundred page synopsis. <laughs> yeah. And and I and I will be honest with you, even though there's a certain element of science to to the job they do, um, the commissioning agent, the person who was responsible for creating this document and doing most of the work on the job was a different person from CSG between the high school and Kamiak. The new person is a guy named Vlad. I'm not going to begin, begin to pronounce his last name, but he is incredibly thorough and uh, incredibly detailed. And I think that's what's reflected in this report. He is also the commissioning agent for the LMS project. So I will, I will get in oh, have some communication with Vlad about uh, trying to present to be a somewhat cliff note version of the of the commission report. I think we'd all appreciate that. <laughs> thank you, Joe. And uh, thank you, Amanda, for bringing that to light as if we didn't know that just by the weight. Um, it was it was large. So um, any further discussion on this uh, commissioning report for Kamiak Elementary School? Uh, hearing none, do we, uh, let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor of passage of this commissioning report, please give me a thumbs up. Okay. Did you get that, Courtney? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're ready to move on there, Courtney. Courtney, can you, when you get a chance, you know. So um, thank you, Jim. The next item is stages of reopening. I put together a, a PowerPoint and what I'd like to do is share some information as we go into this topic. I also wanna point out that I do have on the line um, joining us tonight, Troy Henderson, Director of Whitman County um, Public Health and Michelle Hyatt, our lead nurse is also here. What I'd like to do is provide some information uh, and then uh, I'd like to have kind of a question, answer, discussion. Um, and we have our experts, Michelle and, and Troy here. Uh, I think that would be helpful. I do wanna point out uh, before I begin this slideshow that um, what I'm asking the board is to approve is the stages of reopening. I'm not asking for a start date in order to set a start date, I think we need to have agreement on how we will stage that reopening in a safe, structured manner. So once we have an agreement on the stages of reopening, we can then discuss uh, a start date. I will say that uh, it is very important, I think, for our community to communicate uh, timelines. The November 9th uh, was just uh, a tentative no sooner than because there are still some things if we do get a green light to go or if COVID uh, cases trend down or positivity rate, uh, all those things. Um, with COVID, it's been a very fluid situation. That's why I've asked Troy to be here tonight. Maybe he can give us some insights on um, uh, up-to-date information. So I'd like to begin, kind of go through uh, this PowerPoint and then open it up for discussion, if that's okay with, with you, Dr. Everman. That's fine. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Next. So um, what I'd like to do is talk, uh, go through a little bit about the rationale up to this point for the K-5 in-person hybrid learning recommendation, stages of reopening document, which you've seen several times. It's uh, changed a few times based on uh, feedback to improve readability and understandability. Uh, I wanna share the parent survey results from the elementary. Um, talk a little bit about the elementary students that we've currently served. 
Uh, health and safety protocol, just a quick overview. And some of the commonly asked questions we've received in the past week or so. So again, uh, this is from uh, Troy Henderson. Again, uh, what are the primary factors? And Troy mentions uh, in here, the narrow demographics is one of those uh, the points of rationale. Also the uh, developing evidence of children 11 and under uh, spread the virus less than children 12 and above. And there's also, of course, a growing concern. And I think you've probably received uh, some uh, communications regarding um, some of our K-5 students are really struggling um, on distance education, uh, as well as some of the older students uh, in our uh, system. This is the stages of reopening. I wanna make sure that uh, this is a very, what I call slow start model. Again, uh, one of the questions uh, asked earlier this evening about if we didn't have enough room, uh, would we put all the kids in one room and not have the six foot distancing? No, we would not. We would either find a larger space that would accommodate the six foot distancing, or we may have to re remain on a hybrid system. I'll give you an example at the high school. Um, unless the activity really uh, dropped and it was safe for high school students to go back, in order to meet the six foot distancing, we would have to do hybrid. There's just physically no way to ensure six feet of spacing with students without having a hybrid at the secondary uh, level. At the elementary, we can probably accommodate uh, with some movement of some classes into bigger spaces, having those students um, attend and still maintain that six foot distance. Again, um, this talks about the Washington State rate and also the Whitman County Health Department. Also in Washington State, it is local health departments also are able to provide guidance. Um, and we know that right now, if you looked at those rates, they're very high. They're also very high in Spokane right now. Um, they may not be as high as Whitman County, but they are high and they're well above 75 cases. So again, um, looking at uh, the positivity rate, I know that's something that's come up as well. Uh, so that is something that um, is a concern. And I think we do need to take a look at that as well as possibly hospitalizations in areas. And I'll defer later to Troy uh, to provide uh, maybe a better and more thorough explanation as I am not a medical uh, expert or a public health expert. Next. So again, we did survey our kindergarten first, our second, third, and fourth and fifth grade um, families. Uh, and this was as of uh, October 22nd. Uh, whether if we went to a hybrid in-person, would they choose in-person -learn in learning, which is the green, or distance learning, the blue, or if there was no response or they were undecided. So this is just to give you a, a nice visual of what those survey results indicated. Uh, you can definitely see in um, kindergarten, uh, there's uh, prior, uh, pri <laughs> primarily in person, first grade is primarily in person, second. Uh, then third through uh, fifth is almost even as far as uh, the number of choosing in-person learning versus distance learning. And the undecided is almost equal as well. Very, very close. Uh, there's been questions about, you know, is it safe to be serving students? Um, one of the interesting things with having numerous agencies provide guidance to a school district, we have LNI, the State Department of Health, the County Department of Health, um, OSPI, Labor and Industry, the Governor, uh, proclamations. Uh, we have to navigate that. We have been serving some groups of students in person since June. Uh, and I'll report that, you know, it's been very, very successful. Granted, these are in small groups, as you can see by the numbers, approximately just over 20 kindergartners, first grades, probably around 15, so on and so on. Um, 
I want to also point out that this would not have been possible if we did not have the staff that were um, in the building working, serving these students and providing for their, for their needs. These students are primarily students in special education, second language learners, and or students that have absolutely no connectivity to the internet. That's really, really important that we make sure that we have equity of access. I'd also like to note we're serving 161 secondary students um, between LMS and PHS. Again, some of these days and hours vary by building. Some of the students only come once a week, some come four days a week, some come two, and the number of hours they're in the building um, varies greatly. A lot of questions about health and safety protocols. We have spent a lot of time um, meeting uh, with various agencies regarding health and safety protocols. So again, I just wanna outline some of the, the key pieces I think are important for our community to know. Each building has a COVID supervisor, primarily the building principal. Daily wellness screener protocols are being instituted with students that we're currently seeing and would be um, instituted with any district or any students we brought back in person. Also staff complete these wellness screeners each day as well. Daily temperature checks, we've also installed and are installing thermal scanners in order to help uh, when students are coming to school if needed that may have not had their temperature taken or may be questionable as whether they may have a temperature. Face coverings and physical distancing requirements have been in place uh, from the beginning. And cleaning and des uh, disinfecting protocols, again, for frequently touched surface areas and materials um, have been uh, put together and communicated and will continue to be communicated. Hand washing protocols are also a requirement by OSPI. Signage in the building, we continue to upgrade our signage so it is accurate and visible. Um, also videos, not vids, but videos are created and highlighted uh, to show hand washing protocols, physical distancing, mask wearing, the daily screening process, building specific transitions. So the, each building is creating videos as well as we'll have some general district-wide district -wide videos such as hand washing, physical distancing, mask wearing. COVID screening and isolation procedures are in place and we do rely heavily on the guidance from the Whitman County Health Department regarding the number of cases and when a whole class would have to be uh, quarantined versus just a student. Um, we also have a response and standard letter for potential or confirmed cases they do not identify individuals, but would let the um, people that need to know or closest contact with individuals that um, someone may have tested positive. Social emotional learning is a big component, especially with uh, many of our students online. Um, this provides an opportunity to help them uh, navigate uh, their social emotional well being, uh, being online versus in the building. Additional resources are available for staff. Safe Schools has extra training videos available on the topic of COVID-19. All staff members completed at least one Safe School COVID training, and we do have additional training scheduled. Again, I just wanted to put in, I'm not gonna do an exhaustive list, but these are some of the commonly asked questions. How would students be divided into A and B? Primarily it'd be alphabetically, but it, we obviously know that sometimes it doesn't work out exactly uh, the way we would like it to happen in order to balance. And families would be notified of which group their students been assigned at least one week. Um, I would like to at least have two weeks, but at least no later than one week. Responding to potential and confirmed cases, I think this was a question that came up um, when our visitor section. So we do have protocols in place to respond to COVID. Um, this includes contact tracing and notification of any individual who may have had potential exposure. Uh, notification and communication would occur in partnership with Whitman County Department of Health. Again, we'll comply with uh, privacy legal requirements and transparency and privacy would both be recognized. Staff and students working in or attending the buildings would be notified that there was a case in the building. 
and individuals who determine to have potential close contact will be notified regarding the need for testing or quarantine. How soon do we expect to return or return to school? Uh, it's unknown at this time, but it would not happen any sooner than November 9th in the best case scenario. How many students would be in a classroom? The number of students would vary depending on the size of the classroom and making sure that we adhere to the physical distancing requirement. In most classrooms, we can accommodate between 18 and 20 students and still meet the six foot requirement. I would also note that most of our elementary classes, except for fourth and fifth, uh, would fall um, in, a, in a lower range of probably around 18 or less, possibly more. Do we have a su sufficient substitute pool, including teachers, parapros, office staff? Um, even on a good year, uh, so we would struggle with substitutes. Uh, we are looking at training modules to make sure that uh, they are aware of the health and teaching protocols. We're working on uh, contacting past substitutes to see if they'd be interested in returning to expand the sub pool. We're working on uh, reviewing emergency certifications. And we've also contacted all teachers that have applied for elementary positions and were not selected um, to see if they would be interested in substituting as well. Um, our primary goal is to get students back, but to get them back safely, not only for them and for our staff. Um, I want to send a huge thank you to all of our staff, families, administrators, board members. I know you've all been working tirelessly on the reopening plan. I also want to thank our community members and families for the patience and grace during this difficult time. Everyone wants our students back and everyone wants them back when it's safe. And when that, uh, today trying to determine when that would be and for which group of students is very challenging because this virus is very fluid and changes. So I hope this information was helpful. Again, we do have uh, Troy Henderson and Michelle available as well. And I will turn it back over to you, Dr. Everman, for any additional uh, discussion. Up to uh, questions from the board, uh, Nathan. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I, I prepared a statement that I'd like to read uh, just because there's a lot to think about. Um, and so I wanted to collect my thoughts, but I also wanted to read a statement from Bob uh, in some conversations that we were having via email in leading up to our board meeting tonight. Uh, Bob, when asked when we would approve the date stated uh, that he would ask the board to approve the stages of reopening document, which is what we're doing this evening, and that if approved, it would start the clock to bring back K and first as long as the Whitman County Department still recommends students return in person. Okay, and so just to be clear, just because there's not a date on that document doesn't mean we're not approving a date tonight because that's what that says. And so uh, that is my big concern with uh, the current proposal is the date. Um, and so now I would like to read my statement now that you're aware of the discussion. So first I would really like to just say thank you uh, to everyone who sent in emails. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate you expressing your opinions, especially in email because it gives us all a chance to consider words um, and identify themes to all of, you know, all of your thoughts. And so for this one issue, I have received well over 100 emails, in addition to messages, phone calls, et cetera, all about reopening. I understand we are all in a lot of pain and struggling and want to return to normal. I have a first and second grader myself doing online instruction, and I am desperate to return to school. Um, I also work at WSU, which is central to this outbreak, and my life, like yours, has been turned just upside down. Um, but as a school director, a parent, and a community member here in this community, I cannot support this plan with this associated clock that goes with it. Um, I appreciate every element of the plan. I appreciate the detail. I appreciate the slow rollout. I like, uh, I like the precautionary measures and the training. What I don't appreciate is the timeline. Approving this plan means approving starting phase in in November. Why would we pay such a high cost initially in the fall to bring all of the students online 
for very good reasons that we had in fall for choosing to do so, only to now bring them back when we are approaching the worst of this pandemic. What do we gain with a few weeks of reopening this year that are worth the risk of having to shut down buildings again to get more people sick in our community or perhaps even one more person dying because they caught this virus through our schools? I propose that the board amend the plan or at least the plan for the phase in plan, however this should happen, to begin phase in starting after winter break in January. January 4th, I'm open to the date. Um, the purpose is it's not an arbitrary date. I propose this date because there's a lot of skepticism in our community about this plan. Parents are uncomfortable having to rip their students away from teachers not knowing what winter will bring. Teachers and staff are uncomfortable in experiencing anxiety, depression, fear because of their concerns about bringing students back into their buildings. I mean, frankly, I work at WSU and I'm not allowed in my building right now. Okay, I have to request special permission. Okay, and so teachers are experiencing fear, depression, you know, anxiety, and our community is afflicted with COVID. My concern is that our schools are going to help spread it this winter. Despite the tireless efforts of our administration, teachers, and staff, I know that online education doesn't work for everyone. Our district should continue to serve those most in need and work with people to do the best that we can. But let us not pretend that we have a choice to return to normal, a choice of going back or staying in line. Okay, because either choice we make will not look like it has ever looked in the past or in the present. And each one of them take a toll and have a cost. Our own Pullman Health Department Director, Troy, admits Pullman is in a worse shape than he expected going into the winter months, which he says will be difficult for our county and our town. Right now, cases are isolated because people are quarantining. If we bring more people together in large groups at the onset of an increase in caseloads brought on by winter, it could very well end in a shutdown. Not only will we disrupt student education by moving students from their teachers in November because they chose to go online, but we would again and continuously disrupt school if things proceed as we expect them to this winter. You know, COVID has caught us off guard a lot, and all I'm asking is that we just at least go with what we expect. And my last, and I apologize for this being long, and I appreciate, you know, but un unlike the civilians, you know, I don't get two minutes, I just get to talk. So you guys have to deal with it. Um, but no, my last thought is though some evidence suggests that elementary schools in America can reopen, Pullman is not the typical town with moderate caseloads and low reproduction rates. For a variety of reasons, we have many causes for concern. I advocate we wait through November and December to see what the winter brings and if the situation does not change substantially by the end of December, we open in January to a safer and more predictable outcome. Now, things changed quickly with COVID. Pullman didn't have any deaths until recently, and now we're in the double digits and it's happening daily. Okay, the schools are doing fine now with limited people coming in and out, but we are approaching a difficult winter when things will get worse, not better. Okay. Let Pullman and the school district see what winter has in store by waiting through November and December before beginning to reopen. For our Pullman promise to keep a safe and healthy environment for our students, our staff, and our community. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Any uh, other comments from our board members? I, ha I have a couple of questions for our health officials, please. One, Troy, you're not you're deserting the ship. Uh, congratulations on your new job, but I am concerned now that your replacement is going to come in. Is he going to be on the same page as you, or is there going to be? Are we going to have to go through the whole prepping of figuring out if this is the right move or not? I. I'm a little worried about that, um, though I understand. And my other question is, is there, I don't, I'm not sure, but I keep hearing different things about how this is transmitted mainly through droplets. So if a droplet gets on a surface, do you know how long um, it lasts, the, the virus will last on the surface or, or 
and can it be transmitted that way? So those are my two questions. Troy, are you with us? I am, and uh, thank you, you Susan. Floor. You have the floor. Thank you for the uh, the well wishes. I, I I dislike the reference of abandoning the ship as a retired member. <laughs> I'll live with that. Okay. Uh, and then as far as droplets on the surface, it depends a lot on the surface and what the surface is made of, how big the droplet is, whether there's UV light, sunlight, these types of things. Uh, but the virus can stay viable on the surface for some time. But the initial concerns about spreads uh, on the surface uh, have diminished some as we've learned more about COVID uh, because it is a respiratory disease. And of course, uh, a droplet on the surface, typically you, you get it on your hand, then you put your hand to your face and you inhale some part of that. Uh, and whether you get a sufficient viral load to cause infection, uh, it doesn't seem to happen that often. The, the primary mode of it, uh, uh, transmission is droplets through the air. Uh, there are other ways. There is airborne, smaller particulate that can stay viable, floating in the air for some time, stay suspended. But the primary method, uh, and this is borne out by a lot of evidence, and especially countries that have controlled it, is uh, larger droplets in the air that uh, are suspended for a short time. And that's why masks work so well, because uh, uh, even a homemade mask is pretty good at catching a pretty large moist droplet and keeping you from putting it in your neighbor's face. Uh, in regards to who precedes me uh, in November 16th, when I am no longer the director in the health department, uh, I do not know that's in the hands of the commissioners. Uh, and whether they will be on the same page or not, uh, I, you know, not exactly, uh, because uh, we're all unique individuals. But there is a lot of evidence that uh, supports uh, younger children not spreading the virus as, as much as older children. And that cut off the, the South Korean study was 10 years and below. There was a JAMA article that looked at 12 years and below. Uh, there was an article today uh, that's been put out of Sweden that looked at 13 and, and below. And so that's a little bit of a squishy number. Uh, but there is a, a larger uh, body of evidence each day almost that suggests kids kind of 10, 11, 12 and lower spread the virus a lot less than uh, kids and adults that are older. And that's part of why my recommendations uh, have, have recognized the difference between elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. Uh, and so uh, my current recommendation is I support in-person and hybrid learning for K through five in the Pullman School District. Uh, I still stand by that recommendation. Uh, in regards to whether we should wait till January, February, March, I do have a lot of concerns that January, February, March will be uh, worse nationally uh, and, and very likely locally as well than we currently see. Uh, and so I'm not here to be a proponent for one uh, course of action over another. Uh, I've made the recommendation that I've made. It, it's up to you guys to, to do with that what you will. Uh, happy to answer questions and explain where I'm coming from. But uh, in regards to safety and health, you know, those are relative terms. Uh, there's not 100% safety. Uh, there's not 100% guarantee of health for anyone. Uh, there are risks uh, in everything we do every day. Uh, there are definitely risks with bringing kids back into the classroom, for sure, uh, specific to COVID-19. And there are risks to not doing that as well. Uh, and so you guys have to weigh a lot of those factors that I didn't necessarily consider. I did list that there is evidence that suggests K through five aren't doing as well uh, distance learning than they would in person because I do meet with behavioral health folks and stuff a lot. And I do listen to that, but that's not my specialty. My specialty is community disease public health. And so my primary uh, focus for whether or not I support in-person uh, or a hybrid model for K through five was based primarily on the infectious nature of COVID-19 and what we understand of it today. And again, I, uh, I have supported and continue to support in-person and hybrid learning within the Pullman School District. I will also share that all the other school districts in Whitman County, to my knowledge, are doing some in-person uh, classes through high school. And a lot of schools have had cases. They've had one, two, three, or four. Uh, we have seen very little, and, and in my mind's eye, we have two cases that are questionable whether or not they were contracted in the school. So most of the cases that we've seen in a school setting are folks who have brought it into the school, 
And those schools have found out that the staff wearing masks and the students wearing masks does work and that early identification of folks with symptoms and stuff and sending them home for two weeks does work. And so the chain of infection uh, has not spread through the schools specific to Whitman County. Uh, if any, it has been very little. And that's what other school districts have seen around the world too. And again, there is a difference between children uh, 11 and below and, and 12 and above. Uh, with that, I have forgotten some of the other questions, but uh, I'm happy to uh, answer questions as long as you want to ask them. Thank you, Troy. Um, Allison? Um, yes, Troy, I'm wondering if you could uh, say a little bit more about what metrics, what would trigger you to change your recommendation? Is there um, a certain level of community transmission that would cause you to reverse your recommendation? There, there may be a level of community transmission, but that's less likely uh, a trigger that would cause me to uh, want to restrict in-person learning. What I've shared with the su superintendents uh, is uh, I have no expectation that you won't have cases in your schools but I do have an expectation that you will control the spread within your schools. And so when we see a case or two or three in a school and we do case investigation contact tracing and all the evidence suggests that they got that in a social event that they were all on at Saturday, uh, well, that's fine and we've identified them and we've quarantined them. But if those three people uh, infect five other people in the school, so if we have uh, infection within the school, and especially in middle school and high school, uh, we could we could quickly get to a point where we would recommend a middle school or high school to close for two weeks to stop that chain of infection. Again, elementary school is different, and we continue to watch the evidence build. And if there's new data and studies that suggest that maybe we've been wrong about the uh, reduced transmission among that age group, we would look at it differently. Uh, but right now, if you had an elementary school class and a kid tested positive and we found out and we did what we did to control it, but five days later, two more kids in that class were positive and it appears they were from that child, that would be different if that exact same scenario happened in a middle school or high school because of the understanding of the threat to the community at large. Uh, and so I hope that answers your question, but from my standpoint, and, and I will tell you, I do not have any legal authority as the director of the health department, the health officer does and the board of health does, uh, but we do communicate and I advise those folks and the health officer of course advises us. Uh, and we see these things uh, fairly similarly, uh, but the main thing that we are watching for within a middle school and high school is the spread of the disease within the school itself. Okay. Does that cover your question? Troy, I, I do have a question. Could you uh, address the proximity uh, rate as far as 10%? I know CDC is talking uh, less than 5%, 2%. It, could, you, could you give a little clarification on that? Positive yeah, the, po rate, the positive me. the positive test rate. Yes. Yep. And and I will share a lot of folks go on the state website and they see us at fifty percent or so. The, the the basic problem with the positive uh, test rate is that uh, providers and labs are really good at reporting positive cases, and we get that number, and I have a high confidence that it's probably a hundred percent accurate because they're required to report it by law, and we get it from multiple entities for the same patient. We do not get those kind of reports for negative tests. And so it's hard to do a ratio when you have one of the two numbers is accurate and one of the two numbers is not accurate. Our 10% on our website is based on us calling the five largest testing uh, entities within the county uh, once a week or so as we update that. And we say, hey, can you tell me how many negative tests you have last week? And these testing entities all maintain spreadsheets and they can kind of tell you yeah, we tested 642 people last week or 842 people. And then so we use that negative rate against the positives that we know to get the 10% or so that you've seen on our website. Those numbers are not getting reported to the state in any accurate way. And so that's why their number says 50%. 
the goal of having it less than 5% is because the main thing is that's an indicator that you have sufficient testing within your community. It does tell you that sometimes and early on in the pandemic, we did not have sufficient testing. And early on in the surge in August, August 22nd was the first day with high numbers, we did not have sufficient testing for the, uh, the need. Now we do have sufficient testing. Folks know where to go and they can get it. The 10% rate now is more a measure of that's the amount of uh, community spread and virus in the community. And it's less a measure of uh, an indicator that we don't have enough testing. And there's several things that drive me to make that statement, but I do have a lot of confidence because I do see how many tests that we do a day uh, and I see the availability. Now, there are folks within Pullman School District and within rural communities who have access challenges to get to the test, whether it's driving somewhere or payment challenges. If you're uninsured, underinsured, uh, there are some uh, challenges folks are facing having to pay for the test that's a challenge for some people, and, and that uh, affects testing effectiveness. But 10% uh, positivity rate is not great. Uh, it's not terrible. But I would tell you that that 10% positivity rate is uh, less a measure of us needing more testing because I don't think we do. It's more just a, a good measure of that's a pretty good reflection of the activity rate in our community. And with that being said, I will say that in the last three months or so, we've had cases kind of in three different pots. We, we've had a lot of cases in this 18 to 25 year old young adult demographic that those cases have gone down a lot. Uh, and when we did have a day a few days ago where that was that number was zero, which was quite impressive. And then we've had a surge in cases in long term care assisted living facilities that started about five weeks ago. Uh, and those numbers are staying elevated. Uh, they're kind of stable in some facilities. They've gone down in facilities and we've had some new facilities that have had infections. Uh, and then there's cases within the community at broad you know, just random folks who are going to work interacting in church or the, uh, where, you know, if they go to a restaurant or whatever. Our case, uh, our community spread, that third bucket has been steadily going up. And that's a reflection of what we're seeing nationally as part of this winter surge that we're all anticipating. And uh, the young adult cases have gone down. And I think after Thanksgiving, they will go down more. Uh, our assisted living long-term care facility cases will eventually go down because we will have gone through, you know, almost every facility we have. Uh, there's only so many. Uh, I do anticipate that that third bucket of community spread among the general population uh, will trend upward through February and March. Now, you may have a few weeks where it goes down a little and a few weeks where it goes back up. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, um, it happens that way, but I, I, I have spoken to the healthcare providers in Whitman County, the political leaders in Whitman County, and for several weeks, I have said that I feel like January through March is going to be an, an incredible challenge for uh, the nation and for Whitman County, uh, and uh, that was based on a very narrow amount of data that I'm looking at at my crystal ball, but every week, I get a little bit more data and the picture hasn't changed over the last three weeks. Uh, I said it three or four weeks ago, and I'll say it today, uh, January, February, March look really tough for the United States and for Whitman County. Um, so I hope that answered your question. I, I forgot what your question was by this point. <laughs> thank you, Troy. Um, no, I, 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 I just wanna say, Troy, thank you very much for the medical perspective. Um, I know like us, we, we kind of have to consider some other perspectives though. I mean, staff environment, uh, you know, health and mental health of our students, the uh, strain put on parents, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of elements to this discussion. And I, I think my desire to see us consider a January start date isn't to solidify that, it's to give us time to see what winter brings. And I think Troy, you'll agree with me that we don't know what we don't know about this virus is vastly larger than what we do know. Okay, and we've never gone through a winter with COVID-19. Um, you know, I, as a historian, I worked in mask in the manuscripts, archives, and special collections here at WCU um, on, a, on a journal article on the 1918 flu pandemic at WSU, right? So 
there was an army battalion here, there was a detachment, and this is kind of, I could get into a rambling long story here, but I won't. Um, but the long story short is WSU didn't think, or WSC at the time, didn't think it was going to be a big deal either. Um, a bunch of students died. Uh, they were using churches as morgues. They were using Wilson Hall as a sanitarium. Um, you know, I mean, I think things can get real rough in a, in a viral winter, you know, and Frankly, you telling me that January through March is going to be bad gives me even less confidence that we should begin to reopen our schools beginning November 9th. I mean, what on earth are we gaining by getting kids into class for three or four weeks and then putting them back online again and switching their programs up and switching their teachers up and switching their assignments up? What are we gaining? Oh, Nathan. We're getting at least the students are having some positive interaction with their teachers and are relating more to their instructors. Our kids now are students, lost. Students, lost. you don't have, I watch my kids in class every day. I watch my kids attend their class every day and I watch them teachers do a damn good job engaging those kids. Oh, I, the teachers work are working for everyone. their asses off. It doesn't but. work for everyone, but they're doing a good job. And what's worse is putting everyone in danger in a situation that they don't appreciate. And that well, they don't I don't think we're putting and making our... them afraid to go to work, making them no, afraid no. to go to school. I'm not even allowed in my building. OK, and at WSU is the same as this. Oh, as WSU school. dropped the ball big time. I, yeah, and we're all paying school. for it. I if know. they would have closed in March and told students to go home, this would be a different conversation. But they didn't. And I don't want to talk about the past. Well, they didn't even do the testing. They had said they had the testing. It doesn't matter. We are here today, and in Fine. today, we yeah. have a problem. And that problem right. will not go away in two weeks when we open on November 9th. Allison? Oh, excuse me. And I'm sorry if I just, I understand you guys are getting a little bit heated. Yeah. I, this kind of circles back around to the question that I had for Troy. Um, which is basically what level would it need to get to for you to change the recommendation? Um, so if you're predicting that it's going to get much worse, is there a certain level when you would, would reverse and say, no, we should go back to online? No, the answer to that's no, because it's not the number. So in January, if a lot of 18 to 25 year olds return to Pullman and we see an, another spike within that narrow demographic, that doesn't pose the same. If, if I have uh, 50 cases a day, but 48 of them are in the age of 18 to 25, that's not as bad as if I have 15 cases a day and it's throughout the community. Okay. So <laughs> the, I understand that you are able to disentangle the population. So that's what I'm trying to get to is, is there a number in the community, not in the long-term care facilities bucket and not in the college student bucket, but in the community mm -hmm. spread bucket that would have you reverse this recommendation? And again, it wouldn't be a single number because even within the community, what we see, and especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were seeing on average a case a day, and we could dwell pretty deep into each case, about a third to 40% of those cases were not acquired within Whitman County. It was folks who had shopped, ate, or visited, or worked outside of Whitman County, and then brought the virus back. And so even within community spread, there's some percentage of uh, folks who got it in the community, Whitman County, and the other folks who got it in the broader community, and it was a reflection of the activity in Spokane or the LC Valley. So, no, I get down pretty deep in the weeds on each different scenario, uh, and I, I will not be pinned down to a specific number that says, you know, this much community spread. Uh, because even then, is it affecting the schools? Is it within the children? Is it spreading within the children? or is it 80% of it 30 to 45 year olds? Those things matter. And again, within the school system, the main thing that I'm looking for now for those schools that are in in-person, which is all the school districts except Pullman, is, is the spread within the school. So if, uh, if Hendersonville community in Whitman County has 10 cases next week, and five of those are middle school kids, I wanna know, did those five middle school kids probably get it within the school 
Do they affect kids in the school in six days? Do I see a second generation of disease? Or did they all belong to a Harry Potter reading club uh, and they got it in their basement Saturday night? All those things make a difference because we're trying to determine is the school process the risk or is it other things? So if you have K through th third grade up and running and we have a lot of cases in the community or we have few cases in the community, the bigger question is, is the school uh, activity and those kids coming together is that feeding the viral activity or is it not? And that's what I'm looking at. And the moment that I think middle school and high schools are feeding viral activity within a community is when, and to a lesser extent, elementary school, that's when we would look at, you probably need to shut your school down for two weeks to break this chain of infection. And if your community can't get it under control, then I'm not going to recommend that you can reopen. So it's how the school system is, uh, is affecting the viral load within their community. Amanda, do you have any questions for Troy? Um, I'm just trying to take all of this in. I guess, Troy, I am curious about if you take into consideration the spread between the teachers and staff, not just the students that are in the, these buildings. and. Like you heard um, Desiree Gould talk tonight about the, you know, being a specialist, she's going to be traveling between a lot more humans during a day than, say, just a classroom teacher. Are those sorts of things taken into consideration with your recommendations? They are some, but I do want to be clear in what's not taken into consideration, and that is uh, adults and children who have uh uh, specific pre-existing conditions that make them more susceptible to COVID-19. My recommendation is based on the average, uh, average person, the average people. And I've shared with Bob and all the other superintendents that it's their responsibility, just like any other employer, to identify those employees. And in this case, those students who are at a higher risk and to make accommodations uh, for them. Uh, I'm not going to look at each person individually and say, you know, it may be safe for them to work or not. But I will tell you, my recommendation is not for uh, the 98 year old teacher who has a number of chronic diseases, because if recommendation was based on that, we, we would never have in person school. I mean, we'd be talking about maybe in two years from now. And so my recommendation is for the, the general uh, uh, employee and the general student and the superintendents and those principals need to identify and they have got to identify uh, staff and students who should be excluded. Uh, and, and I think in a hybrid model, you can do that. And I think also in the hybrid model, when you have cases, because you will have cases in school among students and among staff, if you have uh, some folks who are already in an online system, you know, you can try to roll people into that option as they quarantine or, 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 or uh, isolating to recover. May I ask another question? Amanda? Amanda? Does that answer your question? Troy, I have some questions for you. Okay. Um, since the majority of COVID cases are asymptomatic, and with our lack of confidence levels, would testing improve our ability to be more proactive if we saw how many cases there were? Yeah, I do want to push back a little bit that I don't think the majority of cases are asymptomatic. I think the number that is most uh, commonly uh, accepted, at least currently, and that subject to change is about 40 percent, which is a large, but it's not the majority. Uh, with that being said, asymptomatic folks tend to spread the virus a little bit less, too, in part just because if you're not coughing, you're spewing out less little droplets full of virus. And so there's some physical components of being symptomatic versus asymptomatic. Uh, but with that being said, I do agree with you that uh, there are testing protocols and there's additional testing uh, that can make the situation better and make the situation safer. Uh, and we have spoken, uh, I think today, yeah, uh, Scott Adams and I uh, discussed uh, some of these rapid uh, bioassays for antigens that are now available uh, that could be used for especially staff in the schools. They're not the most effective test but they're rapid, you get a result in a few minutes and the test itself is no cost, so that's beneficial. Uh, and so there are some screenings that might be able to be done with something like that 
that would uh, help try to identify somebody who may be asymptomatic and uh, reduce that threat. Question is for Michelle. Michelle, is this is it possible? I, what I'm hearing from my constituents is that there's a lack of confidence in returning to school for safety issues. Would an increase in testing dispel some of that lack of confidence? And could it be done realistically? I'm talking now teachers and staff. Right. So um, I actually talk to, I think I talked to you, Troy, today or yesterday, it's all running together, and some other uh, folks from Whitman County Health Department about testing staff because it would be, um, it would be very beneficial to be able to test staff. The rapid antigen testing that is easy to do and quick results, the state, the Department of Health requires before returning back to school or work that they have PCR test ran on and to be more conclusive. So although a positive test with that, I think would be beneficial to know so that we can keep those people out of schools and out of work um, and quarantined, a negative test isn't going to give us a quick result. It's not going to give us a quick answer to keep kids or staff in school. Yeah, what I'm trying, what I'm thinking of is trying to increase confidence levels within our staff and teachers. And families who, who are hesitant about returning to school. Um, what, I, what I can say to that is I, I'm often in meetings with uh, nurses, school nurses from all over Eastern Washington. Most are in school currently with at least K-1. And they are not, I mean, they're seeing some cases in staff, but they're not seeing any spread at school. I'm seeing the same thing. The few cases that we have had, they're not spread at school. Um, our special ed kids have been back, like Bob said, really since summer. They, um, I haven't had any cases that I'm aware of in special ed. And that's, those were the kids that we were most concerned about, being able to spread it to the adults. We haven't had any problems with that. So those are good things. I do um, agree with what Troy's saying. I, all of the studies show that kids, little kids are not spreading this easily, even within their own homes. Um, so I, I understand their fear. I really do. And I wish I could say that you're going to be safe and you won't end up getting COVID, but I can't say that. There are no guarantees. But it just seems that, um, like I said, other nurses in other districts feel that they're doing a pretty good job in schools. In fact, um, it's pretty much what I do right now. We get a case or a child with a symptom or an adult with a symptom. We're being, the health department and I have worked together very well. We're being very cautious and staff have been really great and same, same with families. You're, you're muted. Troy, I had another question for you. Um, I've heard that there's more household to household spread. So how does it differ from community spread? It does. And when you talk about household spread and what I would call community spread is that third bucket that's within uh, a wide distribution of people within the community. I, I would call those, those are the same for me. They're in the same bucket. So for me, I, right now in Whitman County, in our experience uh, since uh, March 22, uh, I've looked at community spread that's been divided into, did you get it in Whitman County or did you probably get it in another community? Uh, another demographic of young adults, 18 to 25 year olds, and then the demographic of long-term care assisted living facility, and that's residents and staff. Uh, so those have been the three buckets that we've looked at mostly. Okay. Jim, I think Nathan has a question. Uh, Nathan? So Michelle, I appreciate your input there on the, the cases. And I just wonder, I mean, I know that, you know, that this is a new virus. Like, I mean, there were just 500,000 cases last week in America, you know, and it, the case, the community transmission, as Troy says, is already, it's getting worse steadily every day, you know? And so I'm looking at the numbers. I see that what used to be in the summer single digits is now double digits. You know, it's jumping up, it's going down a little bit, but mostly up. Um, you know, what, 
At what point would you be concerned if you start seeing that? I mean, like you see it in one or two staff, yes, but I mean, isn't it a little too late to do anything about it if by the time you start seeing some, you know, widespread cases, I mean, it's, we're kind of already hosed. Um, I think we're jumping on anybody who has any symptoms pretty quickly. Um, I, people have been great about staying home for the most part. They, they I get, I think people are being more cautious than they need to be. Like, they have a, a scratchy throat that morning. They call me and say, you know what? I think it's just a scratchy throat from nasal drainage overnight, but I'm going to stay home just to be safe. Um, I'll, there's a lot of that going on here. So that's, that's good news. Um, parents as well. Um, I have parents that are completing the attestation whose kids aren't even in school, but their kids are sick and they wanted me to know that, you know, their kids are, you know, they wanted guidance hey, my kids are, aren't feeling well, what should we do? They're not in school, but do you have any guidance for us? And so, um, I don't know, I think my problem with accepting the, and sorry, Jim, please shut me up if you, you know, you'd like to move on. But I, I think just my problem with accepting the, the doctor's advice, so to speak, the medical advice, is that, I mean, we have not had this experience before as a society, you know, like this is totally new. And so, Yes, this whole summer we had mild caseloads. There were very low numbers. We're about to hit explosive exponential growth. <laughs> and so, like, you know, the situation that we're approaching is not the one that we're coming from. And I'm, I'm, I keep hearing these references to past activities, like, oh, well, we were able to contain a patient, or oh, we haven't had that much spread in schools. I mean, is no one concerned that we're going to spend an entire winter with no air circulation outdoors? Uh, you know, with kids, you know, masked on, masked off for lunch or food or whatever. I mean, is no one, is it just me? No, I, we're all concerned. I'm concerned, of course. I mean, that's the, my initial job in, as a nurse was in pediatrics for a reason. I mean, I, I worked with kids with cancer, kids with heart transplants. I mean, I, I, I am, I am concerned. I think everybody's concerned. We want what's best for the kids. We want what's best for the community. We want what's best for the family. This is something that it is new. Nobody really knows. We're just looking at data from other places that have had their school districts open for a while. And they're, they seem to be doing pretty well with at least the elementary age kids. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think as many people who are against opening, there are that many people who really need their kids back at school. And we all have a choice. Think, thankfully, we have a choice to stay online if that works best for your family too. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. Um, because there are those that they, for whatever reason, medical reasons, um, they, they, they're choosing not to send their kids back until there's a vaccine, until they're seeing an end to this. So um, I'm very thankful for that. I don't know, Nathan, I think we're all, we're all concerned and uh, this is just a great unknown. Nobody really knows yeah. and things change a lot. Troy, uh, no, had, thank uh, you for the honesty, Michelle. Troy, you had two comments. Yeah, I wanted to make a couple of quick observations. Uh, one, I would like to point out that if you have uh, zero in-person uh, school in, in Pullman School District, you are still going to have cases and students and staff. Yeah, but they're not our fault. Well, I, I do want to point out, though, that there are examples of where you may actually decrease uh, community spread if they're in a better structured environment than if they're left to their own. Uh, okay. So, I mean, that is a thing to consider. That's supposition. Uh, well, uh, so you're supposing you're right, well. but wait, nobody wait, I wanna, wait, please stop. Now, the WSU students who came back this fall were on online classes uh, and they did not do well on their own. Uh, I would propose to you that if those kids had been in WSU classes with some adult supervision for seven hours a day uh, and had to actually get up and go to a class in the morning, uh, it, it, it couldn't have really been worse. So there is that. Uh, okay. Another thing I want to point out. I want to point out with what Michelle just said about people having a choice. If you have some hybrid classes and you have some in-person classes, then people have a choice. But right now, people don't have a choice. So no one is making someone send their child to school if you move to some uh, in-person classes. And I will tell you, I've had several WSU parents call me from different parts of the state and the country who have told me 
uh, my son or my daughter's a student at WSU, they have to go back there for whatever reason. And then they go into this litany of medical conditions that they have that are serious. And then they ask me, how are you going to keep them safe in Pullman? To which I respond, I am not. Uh, if your child has that level of health conditions, they shouldn't be in Pullman. And no, there is nothing in the world that is making a 19-year-old WSU student come to Pullman. And there is nothing in the world making a parent send their child, if they have a whole host of medical conditions, to in-person learning. But if you don't have any in-person classes, then that choice is not available. The board have any further questions? I just want to, yeah, I have one question of them, and that is, what is the difference of uh, going to a school that is clean, the air is uh, highly filtered, um, the services are cleaned all the time, constantly, and that sort of thing, then going out to dinner or going to the grocery store uh, is What's the difference? I'm sure most kids are going to the grocery store, going out to dinner, or going to McDonald's. Isn't it safer actually in the schools where there's a, a much more safety guidelines? I I don't know. Michelle, Troy? Risk, what's the risk difference? There, there, there are risks and there are differences uh, and, and I'm not gonna try to quantify them, but uh, Every day, there are risks in, in what we're choosing to do that day. Um, I have weighed the risk from a public health standpoint for COVID-19 based on the information that I know and that I understand it. Uh, and I read, made the recommendation that I support in-person learning or hybrid learning for K through five for Pullman School District. Uh, I continue uh, to uh, stand behind that recommendation. Thank you, Troy. Michelle. Um, I just want to say, you know, I think that that's the being in school, some of these kids don't have a medical home. So um, they kind of use me as that person. And there are a lot of eyes on these kids. So and we all know kids, they get sick suddenly at school, and the teachers can sometimes say, you know, he doesn't look very good. I do some, you know, I, I'll do an evaluation, we can we're screening them the intent is to screen them quickly, get them into isolation, get them the help that they need, get them home, um, and then do all of the education with the families. I, I don't know, I feel that their parents are being very cautious um, and staff are being very cautious. And I think I, think I have two kids in college um, and I can, and I, I agree with the, when they're coming to school and they have nothing to do but be online, they are bored and they want to get together. They can sleep until noon, they can get online. Um, I, I think having some structure may be more beneficial for some. Um, I don't know, like I said, Nathan, I don't know how to, I can't make everybody feel confident and comfortable because there's, we, we really don't know for sure, but I do feel, I feel pretty good about having little kids in school. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Thank you, Troy. Any other questions for Michelle and Troy this evening from the board? Okay. Uh, I do have one question, Jim, uh, for, ahead, Bob. for Troy. Um, you know, I, I think we've learned a lot in, in six months in dealing with COVID, not that we know everything. Um, I think our staff have, have done an outstanding job and I know it's not easy. We care about the staff safety. I care about the student safety. This is not easy at all. And it's not a position that, you know, um, I relish being in it, trying to, to balance the needs of every, every student in the district. Um, I, I am worried. Um, I continue to weigh every day what's what's the best pathway to keep people safe, but also keep our, our kids engaged. I am extremely worried, um, in particular with secondary and the engaging those students and making sure that they are being successful in their classes. That said, um, we have a, a proven record with small groups and, and Troy, I want to ask your, your, you know, given, given that you are trying to predict with a crystal ball, 
you know, given winter or flu season, it might be the same or could be worse. Um, rec recommendation regarding small pods of students that currently like we're bringing in uh, in very small groups for maybe a portion of the day. And I'm thinking of particular secondary students that may be struggling and need some more in-person instruction or looking at a CTE, metals and woods. I know um, the community colleges are, have been pretty successful bringing in very small groups of students for a limited amount of time to get the hands-on pieces that those courses um, require. Any thoughts uh, regarding that, uh, given your crystal ball and if things kind of stay the way they are and, and are not improving? Yeah, I have supported small pods uh, in, with some other schools. And, and what I have said to other school superintendents is uh, if you're bringing uh, six kids in for welding or whatever, anytime you're under the 10 person limit for phase three, uh, I think that of that less as a uh, in-person class setting and more of a, you know, whether it's welding club or a tutoring session. Uh, and so from my vantage uh, under phase three requirements, if you're staying under 10 folks and that would be kids, staff and everybody else, uh, I don't particularly have an issue with that. I would say uh, as community spread, if it picks up through the winter and if the flu season is uh, even average and if January, February, and March is as bad as it could be, uh, I could see small pods definitely being canceled for middle school and high school kids uh, just because of the, the threat to that age demographic and the community. Uh, but that would be at the same time, you would be also looking at no more in-person restaurants, the movie theater would be closed and all those other things. Uh, so it would, it would still kind of track that, you know, if the governor's allowing phase three up to 10 folks, I'm okay with that, but I do anticipate that January, February, March, uh, we very well might not be in a phase three. You can have groups up to 10 setting. Uh, it, could, it could get quite bad and, uh, and that may no longer be appropriate. Thank you. Uh, I think Nathan has his hand up, Jim. Nathan. Thank you, Jim. Um, I mean, you know, me writing that statement out talking to you guys i'm really trying to avoid the chaos that will ensue when we try to rush and open and then we have to close again and then we have to close a building or we have to close a class or we have to close it all i'm listening to troy say it's going to get worse in january february march okay and i'm listening to the national news saying that and dr fauci saying that and our governor saying that and the state health department saying that and so we're not at a comfortable case level right now. Troy has recommended that we can go back with community spread increasing, which seems to contradict the state's guidelines, but I'm not a doctor and so I don't know. Um, all I know is what I'm hearing is it's gonna get worse, okay? And so why are we doing this for three or four weeks, maybe five weeks so that we can shut down again? Why don't we just work on making the online work until we know what to do? Okay, and, and when I say wait till January, and, and I do want a motion at the end of this little spiel I'm doing, but I, Bob, I don't even know what motion to make because the plan doesn't have a date on it, though you say when we approve the plan, we're tacitly approving a date. And so my motion would be that we make whatever edits to the executive statement or plan that we need to to stipulate that we'll open January 4th unless conditions worsen to the point where the recommendation is we close. Um, and that's my motion. So I'm moving that we amend the phase plan to stipulate a date of January 4th, or we have an emergency board meeting in the next week to discuss this. That's my motion. We have a motion on the floor. Um, can you show that uh, your slide presentation that had that resolution for the return to school reopening the plan, the reopening plan? Yeah, just I a didn't second. See the date on, I didn't see the date on there. No, there. Uh, I do not believe there's a date, but we can pull it up here in a second. The date was given in an email to all staff. Um, right. And was mentioned uh, as part of the approval process for this evening's board meeting. 
Um, and I was curious because I didn't see a date on the document. And that's why I asked the question of Bob. Um, and he said, with us approving this document, we would tacitly be approving a clock that counts down to November 9th. Is that correct, Bob? Yeah, it's a, it's a possibility. No de date was set, nor did I, am I asking for a date, but I wanted to make sure if we're gonna approve the stages of reopening, the question would be, when would be the soonest if we were to set a date? I am fine with whatever amendment you would like to propose for this. I think it's the key here tonight, and my goal is if and when we have a date, I think we need to have a stage or at least something that we can follow that makes sense that uh, would help guide our reopening in a slow manner that would allow us to pause or not accelerate if things uh, continued to get worse. So, uh, but I did did want to get something into the hands because the question, and we've been working with the K-1 staff, um, you know, on trying to think of when would be the soonest. And we've, we've played around with a lot of different tentative dates. Um, and I want to make sure it's clear in that letter, it's a possibility, it was a possibility, it's not a set date. And I, you know, I serve at the board's pleasure and I'm trying to put together a plan. I think we need to have a plan before we can give a date, because if we don't have a plan, we just say a date, then what do we have? So uh, I am fine with, if you wanna amend, if you wanna have a special session, I am absolutely fine with that. I know this is a very difficult uh, position to be in and, um, I think we need to have uh, the ability to have this kind of discussion tonight. I think it's very important. And having uh, Michelle and Troy here, I, I really do appreciate having them here to answer the questions that I cannot because I'm not a public health expert. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, so may I clarify my motion, Jim, now that I understand with Bob? Please. Uh, yeah, so I, I would like to move um, that we set the date for beginning this phase plan to the beginning of January unless the health department recommendations change. I would hope that we have a new director of health department by then. Um, I would hope that we know more about what winter brings by then. And I would hope that we would have a better grasp on what we need to do. And those are my reasons. Is there a way to approve the plan without setting a date tonight? And continue to discuss when it we feel it's appropriate to start school i i there, am there is. not comfortable setting a date i see nathan's point i also am concerned about the fact that we're going into holidays where there's going to be traveling and imminent gathering and what that's going to bring back to our community um but i I think the plan is fantastic. Okay, I think man, that Amanda has gone into this plan and I okay. think it looks really great. And I am comfortable myself having elementary school age kids with this plan. I'm not comfortable deciding on a date, whether that's November 9th or January 4th tonight, but I would like to be a part of that conversation. And I think a special board meeting when we were able to pin down that date would be very appropriate. Okay. Uh, Nathan has proposed a motion. The motion is on the floor to accept the stages of reopening and set our start date on or about January 4th. Do we hear a second to that? Okay, no second. Uh, Nathan, that fails for lack of second. Uh, Amanda, would you like to propose a new motion, please? I would move that we approve the stages of reopening without setting a date tonight and plan to have a special board meeting to determine that date when appropriate. Second. We have a, a motion made and a second. Um, now we have time for discussion. And I just, for the record, um, I'm cool with either one of these outcomes. I know in my statement, 
uh, I did say I'm, this plan is great. It's not the plan that it concerns me. It's the date. And so, however, the board decides to reconcile the date, I will work with you guys to do so. I just, you know, am not comfortable with the current date. So I totally support Amanda's motion. Thank you. Any, Can we uh, go back to seeing faces? Is that possible? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> So we have a motion on the floor. It's been seconded that we approve the reopening plan without a uh, firm start date. And that a special session would be called to talk about the special for the start date. Is that correct? Okay. So further discussion. Um, I guess I'm I'm prepared to support approving this plan, but it's a double barreled um, motion that then requires us to have a special meeting. Um, so <laughs> I'm less enthused about that, but yeah, I can go along with that. Well, and maybe a special meeting wouldn't be necessary. Maybe it would align with our next board meeting. Or so, a board meeting in the future. So Amanda, Amanda, do you want to amend your motion? Um, so I would move that we approve the stages of reopening plan without setting a date tonight. And the board would have a discussion once we're comfortable setting a date in a regular board meeting or a special meeting, depending on what's needed. Is that, oh, I know. Uh, uh, Allison? Go ahead, Susan. A little more flexibility. Well, my thinking is, yes, there's flexibility in that, but um, oh, never mind. I, I think that uh, setting a date is going to be impossible. So uh, I don't see why we could approve the date maybe that is suggested by our superintendent that we hired to uh, run the district and who was also the one who is, you know, right in the thick of everything and knows the rationales, the reasonings, um, has worked with the our uh, pub, the teachers union and everybody else on this. They, that's how they came up with this uh, opening stages thing. I think I don't feel it's necessary for me to okay the date that school starts, but that's just me. So I don't think we, maybe you want a special meeting, that's fine. Just my maybe. two cents with. Maybe. I basically agree with that also. So I will say when I first started the board, you guys told me about the schedule that the school board decides when school starts and school stops and everything else is up to, you know, negotiation. And so I call this, we're deciding when school starts. And so, um, I mean, I'm cool with Amanda. I just because of Bob's concerns about people wanting to plan, I do think we owe the community some sort of answer about what our intentions are. Because I don't, what I don't want to do is continue this forever and just keep people ramping up, right? And so, I would ask that in the next two weeks, Amanda, like that you add that to your motion. In the next two weeks, if we don't talk about it at our next board meeting. You know, and I will let board planning between Bob and Susan decide when uh, we either do a special meeting or we do it at the next board meeting. But just sometime soon, we need to decide, I think. That's that's all I would add. Okay, Amanda, would you like to amend your motion again? I would like to end my motion again to approve the stages of reopening plan without setting a date to Perfect. And for the board and to oh. hopefully decide on a start date by our next board meeting in two weeks or okay. have the discussion. There you go, whatever. I think that allows a lot of flexibility here, but it does put a time limit on when we need to meet to decide a new start date or a proposed start date. That's what this was about all the time anyway, it was a proposed start date, which wasn't fixed anyway. So I think we have to be careful here. The proposed start date of 
November 9th, um, we're just proposing that there be a new start date. And we'll deliberate over that either at a special meeting or at the next board meeting, but within two weeks. Well, and I would also just like to, to add that, you know, I think that there's a lot of emotion that ends up coming into this. And I think that there's a part of, I know me, and it came across to me tonight with listening to Nathan, that by making these decisions, I feel a lot of responsibility for making the best decision for the community and our parents and our staff and teachers and students. I mean, there's just a lot. And I, you know, if we cause a death in the community, that would, I would feel a lot of responsibility on my shoulders based on the decisions that I've made. So I, it's, I, I understand, I understand that. So, okay, so we have a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. Um, is Courtney available to reread that motion as presented, Bob? I, I think she's going to give it a try. If not, I can. Give it a try, guys. <laughs> okay, so I think where we're at is Amanda made a motion to approve the re reopening stages document without setting a start date for the board to decide on. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Amanda made a motion to approve the reopening stages document without setting a start date. The board will decide on the start date by the next board meeting in two weeks. I would say proposed start date, Amanda. Just a suggestion, sorry. Yeah, we don't dare make affirmative plans these days. That's Pro proposed start date. Yes, that's what I'm suggesting. Yes. Do I need to say it again? No, gotcha. you're good. She's no. got it. She's got I it. I second out. all of those things. Any further discussion? Okay, I'm going to put it to vote. All those in favor, give me a thumbs up. Okay, I have four. four thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Did you put your thumb up, Jim? Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to vote. I thought I was the. Okay. <laughs> Just all right. Okay. Thank you very much, all for the evening. Thank you, board, for doing this. It was a tough one, but we had we had the experts here. That was great. Michelle was here. Troy was here. But Amanda's correct. We have a lot of emotion going on. We've all been feeling it. I want to thank uh, Troy for his time tonight, and I want to thank Michelle for her time tonight. Um, I know both of them have been working extremely hard, and uh, Michelle is, has been working uh, probably more than she's ever wanted to work in her entire life. So thank you both. Okay. Thank you both. All right, Jim, we have one more action item. It's 31, 22 uh, excused and unexcused absences. So I did talk at uh, our last board meeting about this. So this was in the uh, September 2020 policy alert. It's been revised by WASDA to reflect the emergency rules that have been adopted by OSPI to define absences in the context of remote instruction and daily attendance. So but again, the revisions include expanded list of excused absence categories uh, a non-truancy absent code, which now has changed after October 5th, I believe, and addresses a tiered support for students. Um, I don't recall any uh, additional questions other than a clarification on um, what happens between us approving it now and when it went into effect October 5th, uh, we've made contingency plans to address any differences between that time. Other than that, I don't believe there were any other questions or concerns. I move approval of policy 3122. Second. Okay. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Nathan. It's been a, a motion has been made and seconded that we approve policy 3122. Um, discussion. And we have we've had some good discussions tonight. Thank you. But 
now we're focusing on this. Could you put it back to gallery view so I can see who? <laughs> Thank you. So we have discussion. Not for me. Okay. Hearing no, hearing no uh, additional comments or discussion. All those in favor of this uh, proposed uh, policy, uh, thumbs up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Okay, now we have uh, no discussion items this evening. We have a number of in informational items. Um, and Bob, do we have, we do have an executive or closed session this evening, correct? We do. Uh, we do have an exec session tonight. Property discussion, I anticipate, would be no more than 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. And I would like uh, Joe and Diane to stay for the exec session, please. Okay, good. Other than that, you can adjourn the, me adjourn the meeting, sorry. Yeah. All right, we'll adjourn the meeting and reconvene uh, to do our executive session. And Roberta, you were also- Did I hear that right?